So thank you very much for the very kind introduction and uh, thanks to NCAN for uh, inviting me to speak. So what I was going to talk to you about is, uh, let's see if I can, there we go. So a medical management of uh, neuron tumors, uh, uh, targeted therapy and how to manage toxicity. So this is a really broad topic. So I'm going to try to approach this from uh, sort of 30,000 uh, 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 feet uh, and, uh, and sort of zoom in on certain uh, tumor uh, or certain drug types and, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about how we manage some of the common toxicities. So these are my disclosures. And uh, let's just get into the, uh, the, ba the basics. So... <laughs> So uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, systemic and targeted therapy, so as you know, many patients with neuron tumors do present uh, with, uh, with uh, advanced uh, or metastatic disease, and others will have localized disease, and it will later come back as metastatic disease. So there is a huge need for what we call systemic therapy. So what is systemic therapy? You're going to hear this a lot. I actually like that word but better than like chemotherapy or targeted therapy. This is essentially giving a medication into your system, be it as a pill or an infusion, that then goes around uh, everywhere in the body and, and, and hits the tumor where it is. So uh, the choice of uh, the uh, systemic therapy depends on a lot of different things. Obviously, the type of the tumor, the location, where did it start, pancreatic is treated differently than, uh, than a small bowel, and um, presence of symptoms, sometimes we go after tumor control, sometimes we're going after symptom control, sometimes we're trying to do both. And other medical conditions, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. So moving on. So. Uh, all anti-cancer therapy, it really is targeted. So we're, we're trying to target the cancer. But some drugs uh, are actually more sort of more targeted than others. And the tar targets can be of many types. I'll show you a few targets here in a little bit. So it can be something on the surface of the tumor cells. So something that, uh, that <clears throat> sits on the tumor cell that we can target with, uh, with a medication. It can also be something that's within the uh, tumor cell. And even more, it can be something, it, the target may actually not be the tumor itself. The target could be your own immune system. We're trying to rev up your immune system, so that can actually start recognizing cancer and, uh, and uh, start killing cancer cells. So the targeted therapy doesn't always have to be against the tumor. So um, cancer cells or cancers are really, really complicated. And uh, as I was told when I started oncology, so my first day in oncology clinic uh, with my, one of my mentors, he said, uh, remember this, Thor, uh, cancers are uh, smarter than most oncologists. So that actually has, uh, it may still be true for many cancers, but actually I think the gap is really, really closing. So uh, this is in 2003, and the things we had in 2003 are nothing like we have today. So, um, and you look at all of these moving parts, it's like this really uh, sort of uh, elaborate clockwork. So this cog could be the target uh, for this tumor. It could be that cog, or maybe we're doing something really nonspecific and just throwing a wrench somewhere in and just hoping it will stop. And that's what some targeted therapy actually does. So uh, this is what it looks like sort of more for us uh, who deal with uh, cancer as a science. So all of these like really complicated networks of these molecules that talk to that molecule and, uh, and that makes the cancer tick. And if you stick, uh, throw a wrench into to one of those parts, it's going to make everything sort of grind to a halt. It's not quite as simple as that, but it's just a really, really complicated uh, sort of network of things uh, going on there. So targeted therapy as such is very unlikely, at least the current treatment, to, uh, to eradicate the tumor, make everything go away. But what we're trying to do is to slow tumor growth. We're trying to shrink tumors a lot of times to relieve symptoms, but really it's sort of this uh, trying to set the clock back or at least stop the clock from moving. And um, we can do that uh, in a variety of ways. And we heard the wonderful talks about surgery earlier today. So um, the targeted therapy often misses it. Uh, the mark. So here we have a target, we have a targeted therapy, and now it's hitting a lot of things that are not necessarily the target in normal tissues as well. And this could be, uh, this is why we get side effects from uh, a lot of these drugs. So some of these targets are actually not just present in tumor cells. They could actually be present in, in normal parts of the body. So then it's still targeted therapy, but the target is in more, is in more than one place. So uh, let's go into some of the specifics here. And uh, I'm going to take, like I said, the really broad view of, uh, of uh, targeted therapy and they go into uh, sort of certain classes of drugs. So the most commonly uh, 
used to target is the somatostatin receptor. So what this here is, this is my own artwork, this is about as good as I get with art. So we have a, uh, this uh, neuron tumor cell with the nucleus in there, and we have these uh, like blue things on the surface. These are the somatostatin receptors that are present on almost all well-differentiated neuron tumors. So something that's al almost always present on the tumors is actually a good target. But these receptors are also present in a lot of normal tissue. So we can hit this with uh, what's called somatostatin analog, so octreotide or santostatin or lanreotide, also known as somatuline. So and uh, when we do that, we have this drug that sort of binds to these receptors here, and then it sends this signal into the cell to uh, uh, tell the cell cells, stop growing, stop making all of these uh, chemicals that are making people sick. And um, so we have less diarrhea. Patients with functional neuron tumors uh, from the pancreas will have uh, less, uh, uh, less uh, uh, symptoms from that. But it unfortunately, it doesn't really work forever. Usually, after a number of years, uh, the, the cancer cells figure out a way around this. We have, we're hitting the target, but the treatment is just over time getting less and less effective. And then we have the off-target effects, and we heard a little bit about the diarrhea that we uh, see in patients on these drugs. So this is because the pancreas is now not uh, making the, the necessary enzymes to digest fat. That's called steatorrhea, so increased fatness. We have ways to test and treat all of these things. It, it, it can raise the blood sugars and cause diabetes, and there was just a very, very recent paper on that suggesting it's actually more common than we thought and can occasionally slow the heart rate, but usually not to, to the point that causes any problems. Well, we can also target this by delivering radiation treatment to this, and we're gonna hear a lot more about that uh, later today, but I just wanted to show how we use these targets. So again, we have the neuron consumer cell, we have the receptors, and uh, we have what's called PRRT. So for that to work, we have to have the receptor, that's this SSTR stands for some instant receptor. So that has to be there. We have to have something that binds to the receptor. Then we have to have something that kills tumor cells. So that would be lutetium-177 or maybe actinium-225 and others that are coming. And then we have to somehow glue all of this together and uh, so it all sort of sticks together. And then we send this in uh, through the vein and it floats around the body, sticks to the cancer cells wherever they are and uh, delivers this radiation treatment, this tiny little charts of radiation, now delivered right to the tumor cell. So this is, I think, an uh, a really good example of a targeted therapy, but when we talk about targeted therapy, we are typically not talking about PRT, but it's actually a good example of that. So this is how it works. So now we have poisoned that, uh, that uh, uh, neuron tumor cell by delivering a charge of radiation that sits now on the surface and sends this lethal radiation right into the tumor cell and kills it. So moving on, so PRT is uh, not uh, completely uh, without, uh, out without side effects. So here we are talking about some of those off-target toxicity. So this is radioactive chemical that is now sitting in your bone marrow and can cause some damage to your uh, blood cells and eventually can actually lead to leukemia in a tiny minority of patients, probably less than three, uh, two to three percent. And that can, can also lower the blood counts, and that usually is reversible, and the, those blood counts come back up fairly quickly. And there's really not a good way to predict uh, who's gonna have this leukemia. Hopefully, we'll have ways to predict that before we go into PRRT, we might actually be have these tests where we can do a blood test and we can actually see, well, you have a slightly higher risk of leukemia than you do, so maybe we should do PRRT early in you and late in you. So uh, we don't have those tests yet. We're, we're actually looking at these studies at Mayo now. So uh, as for the somatostatin analogs, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the side effects. So uh, the, the diarrhea or the loose stools because of the inability to digest fat is definitely there. And, uh, but the problem is that if you have someone with a neuron tumor with diarrhea, they can have diarrhea for a number of different reasons. It can be from the carcinoid syndrome. It can be from the drug that's now limiting the ability to digest fat can also be because you have had surgery, a piece of your small bowel has now been removed, and this is an important piece for digestion, and now you're having what's called bile acid diarrhea, and all of these three things can come together. And we now have uh, tests and, um, and treatments for all of this, but you just really have to think about it. Just not assume that all diarrhea in a person with a, with a neuron consumer is carcinoid syndrome. So, a few basic facts on the targeted therapy, and they, I get these questions a lot. So, um, so uh, people say, well, 
can't you just do like genetic testing and find mutations and we can then target those mutations? Well, the thing is that most low-grade neuron tumors don't really have recurring, uh, sort of recurrent uh, mutations that we can target with the currently available drugs. Eventually, I think we'll get there. But uh, if you do genetic testing on these tumors, you're not going to find a whole lot. And if you find mutations, these are mutations we can't really target with the drugs we have today. But we, the drugs of tomorrow and next year might actually be able to target some of those mutations. The other question I get a lot, what about immunotherapy? So target your immune system. Let the immune system do the work. Well, for well-differentiated neuron tumors, that does not work really well. It's been tested repeatedly, and it just doesn't work. For high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, immunotherapy works better. Not great, but definitely better. So uh, let's talk briefly about some of the two, uh, the two major classes of therapy. So we have the what's called the multi-kinase inhibitors. So these are drugs that target the blood vessel formation and uh, and some other finer, like small parts of the cancer cell machinery. So uh, we have only one approved drug for this, sunetinib or sutent, and that's only approved for uh, pancreatic neuron tumors. We're going to have more of these drugs, and I'll talk about about that a little bit more here. And then we have the mTOR inhibitors, which we have one approved, which is Everolimus or uh, Affinitor, and that's approved for a small bowel, pancreas, and lung neuron tumors. So I wanted to show you uh, what, when we look at these studies, uh, we obviously read these reports in the scientific journal, and they wanted to show you what we, uh, what we call the survival curve. So this is sunetinib or sutent. So in this uh, trial, patients with pancreatic neuron tumors were either given placebo or uh, sutent or sunetinib, and then uh, they were followed with scans, and uh, then uh, when uh, they had growing tumors, the trial uh, therapy was stopped. And we come up with these numbers that we call uh, progression-free survival. So on here you can see at 12 months, uh, about half of the patients on sunetinib at 12 months from starting therapy still had tumors that were not growing, but those who were on placebo, you can see that almost all of them had uh, growing tumors at uh, 12 months. So these are, I just wanted to uh, show you uh, these uh, curves and, uh, and, uh, and sort of let you know what we are reading into these, uh, these papers when they come out. This is what's called overall survival, and here we see at two years how many are alive, and these are old studies, so this doesn't apply to uh, us today, but these are just studies that have been published in the past. So then we look at how many are alive at three years, and then five years. So Everolimus or Affinitor, we have the same. So this was uh, also studied in patients with uh, pancreatic neuron tumors, and here we can see at 12 months, uh, about 50% of the patients who were on uh, Affinitor had not progressed at 12 months, while uh, almost everyone who was on placebo had. So this is just a way of us to look at how effective these drugs are. This does not mean that there's a timestamp on a person. So people say, well, okay, so 12 months, so you're saying that this is going to work for 12 months. Uh, well, there are people where it works actually a lot longer. I had one patient who was on Affinitor for five years, no tumor growth, and we actually had to stop it for side effects eventually. So I'm just going to go quickly through this so we can just uh, show you that these, uh, these uh, uh, drugs have all been uh, looked at here. Everolimus, Raffinitor, and small bowel and lung nets. Again, we're seeing uh, that, uh, that in this study here at uh, two years, uh, actually most of the patients are still alive. And this is before we got PRRT in the U.S. So these curves actually look better today. So a few things to keep an eye on, so the things on the horizon. So surafatinib is a drug that works on, it's one of those kinase inhibitor drugs. It's a pill. It's been studied extensively in China, very, very well studied, seems to work well. And this actually might get approved by the FDA. We're all waiting to see, and there might actually be a decision on it later this month or next month. So we'll have to see what that looks like. Cabozantinib is another, stud another drug that's being studied uh, now all across the U.S. in a large network of clinical trial uh, hospitals, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have some data in two years on that. And then we have these two other drugs, lenvatinib and naxetinib. Both are uh, active, but they have substantial side effects and toxicities. For example, the lenvatinib uh, drug was studied in Europe. It works, but 92% of patients, so more than 9 out of 10, had to either drop the drug or drop the dose just to be able to stay on it. So these can have significant side effects. So as for managing the side effects, there are some general rules. So uh, if there are side effects, we stop the treatment, and then we wait until the side effects get better, then we get back on the treatment, often at a lower dose. Sometimes it's just better to switch the treatment. If it's really severe side effects, it's just better to switch. And uh, then we can use drugs to help with diarrhea, if that's the problem, 
drugs to help with blood pressure if that's a problem. And for Affinitor, we have uh, uh, the diabetes that can be worsened by this, and we may have to uh, sort of in be more aggressive managing that. Mouth sores, well, by taking the drug with, uh, with food, it can actually decrease the mouth sores by using uh, dexamethasone mouthwash. It's a steroid mouthwash. We can actually minimize uh, or decrease the mouth sores. So we have these uh, different ways we def deal with different toxicities, but the key is really for the patients and uh, their, uh, their uh, caregivers to let us, let us, the, the treating physicians, know, because I tell my patients, I, don't, I can feel your mouth sores. If you don't call me with your mouth sores, I'm not gonna know. And, uh, so, and people say, I don't wanna call you with like three mouth sores, but three mouth sores can be pretty painful. So uh, speak up, let us know. So, uh, so which one to choose, everolimus or senectinib uh, for pancreatic neuron tumors? This also depends on, let's say if you have diabetes, well, senectinib might actually be a better choice. If you have really bad hypertension, well, uh, everolimus might be a better choice for you. So we have to look at not just the tumor, uh, but also the, uh, the underlying, uh, underlying uh, other health conditions. So immunotherapy, I touched on this briefly. Sadly, this does not seem to work for well-differentiated neuron tumors, at least not for most of them. For some of the more aggressive tumors, it has some activity. But we will get better immunotherapy. And we will probably somehow figure out to combine immunotherapy with other drugs to make it work better. So uh, the way I think about this here is that if I have someone with, uh, with a small bowel neuron tumor, we start with a somatostatin analog, then we have PRRT or Averolimus, and then if uh, that doesn't work, we can possibly go to a kinase inhibitor like cabozantinib or suripatinib. We'll know soon. And uh, for the pancreatic nets, a little bit more complicated, so we start with somatostatin analogs, but then we have all these other options we haven't really talked much about, like capecitabine, temozolomide, and... Uh, and uh, but we have more options for pancreatic nets than we have for small bowel nets. But hopefully we'll have more options for small bowel nets soon. And then we can sort of cycle through the options. If you haven't had this before, we're gonna try it now. And, uh, and uh, we can sometimes even go back to drugs that uh, were t either toxic or didn't really work that well. Two, two or three years later, we can actually revisit that same drug. So uh, other notable advances, this, I won't speak much about this. It's a new drug that just got approved last year called Belsotifa, and this works for, uh, for uh, pancreatic neuron tumors in patients with what's called von Hippolyndo. It's an inherited, really rare condition. So just to give you an idea about the new drugs that are coming, we're gonna get a lot more of these drugs in the future. So just to conclude here, so there are several targeted therapies available. For pancreatic nets, we have Averolimus and Sunetinib. For small bone and lung nets, we have Averolimus. And uh, multiple drugs being looked at right now. Toxicities are common, but mostly manageable, but you have to let us know And uh, if you're having side effects. We can usually continue the treatment sometimes at a lower dose, and the key is really just to communicate with your treating team if you're having uh, problems. So that brings me to the end, and one picture from Iceland at the end. Thank <laughs> you.